you check out the uh, cover of the bulletin. Everybody have a bulletin? It is a royal image. It looks like dinner with a king and queen, maybe, although their image is kind of tiny. But check out the affair. You see how folks are dressed? Can you imagine going to an event like that? I mean, there's been times over the years where I've been invited to uh, an event where uh, maybe a politician was being sworn in and I was asked to give the invocation or something, but nothing like this. I mean, check out the, uh, the dark red, the, the royal colors, the high ceiling, the special lighting, the way everyone's dressed, the candelabras. This is a fancy event to dine with the king. Imagine you're there, and you're eating. Imagine, imagine you're at the head table with the king, and you're eating. How comfortable would you be? You've got to watch your manners. You know which fork to start with? <laughs> you go to one of those fancy dinners, you know, you've got know, you to know your silverware. If you drink tea, do you have to keep your little pinky out? <laughs> got to remember all that stuff, right? I don't know, I'd be nervous if I had to go and have dinner, and especially sit at the head table, the main table. Well, imagine further if for some reason you, were, you had been thrown in jail and um, somebody came and released you and took you out of the dungeon into the uh, main floor where this event was being held and they led you into the room. And you're like fixing your hair, you know, you're like, holy cow, you know. And they not only brought you into the room, but they told you to go sit at the head table. Wow, how would that be? It seems crazy, but buried in the Old Testament is a story where this happened to somebody. Guy's name was Jehoiakim. And why in the world would I be telling you this story today? Because I believe on some level the story I'm going to share from Scripture may be your story and my story. So let me tell you how it goes. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 25. Now, 2 Kings chapter 25 is the last chapter in 2 Kings. So this is the end. And in 2 Kings 25, we have an account of a terrible episode in Israel's history. So the story kind of starts in a bad way and then ends in a good way. And the bad way that it starts is, is that the people of Israel have not been faithful to God. And so it would seem that God has allowed another country to come in and take over Judah. Israel was kind of like in two parts, Israel and Judah. And so the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he swoops in and takes over uh, the area of Judah and kills a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of the Israelites. They're outnumbered. They, he kills all these people. And then he takes most of the people from Judah out of their homeland and takes them to Babylon. And there they'll stay for decades. Now, this was a terrible thing. And if you think about it, imagine somebody taking over South Jersey. And they come to your house. And you can't pack up anything your beloved objects. You just kind of have the clothes on your back and they form a giant caravan and you have to go to that terrible place called North Jersey. Oh, oh my gosh. We'll never survive. No, but you know, you go into a different place and life is different up there, right? If you spend any time in North Jersey, it's a little different than South Jersey. Just an example. Stay with me. What would that be like? You just, you know, you couldn't take your stuff. You wouldn't have the comforts, you know, that you enjoy down here. Maybe the McDonald's ice cream isn't the same up there as it is down here. Maybe they do answer the drive through though. But anyway, you, know, you couldn't take everything with you. It would be so different. And you'd have to live up there for years. And you'd kind of be a prisoner because you'd have to stay in that area. That's what happened in the kingdom of Judah. They, they took all their people, led them all away. The and so the king of Judah had no purpose at that point. He had no kingdom to rule over. So when Babylon conquered Judah, they took the king, and that was Jehoiakim, they threw him in jail. And he was in jail for 37 years. 
He didn't do anything wrong. He just happened to be the king of Judah when they got overtaken. So he's in jail. Babylon and this terrible king, Nebuchadnezzar, they're in control. And then things change, which always makes for a good story. And we learn about the change at the end of the chapter. And I want to read these few verses for you so you can hear it right from Scripture. Because what happens is Jehoiakim is going to get released from prison. And he's going to dine with the king. Verse 27, in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the year Ewol Marduk became king of Babylon, he released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. So King Nebuchadnezzar dies, and his son now takes over, and the son has a little more compassion and says, why do we got this guy Jehoiakim in jail? He didn't do anything, so they, they release him from prison after 37 years. He did this on the 27th day of the 12th month. He spoke kindly to Jehoiakim and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king gave Jehoiakim a regular allowance as long as he lived. What a turn of events. Jehoiakim is big deal king of Judah. All of a sudden, he's thrown in jail for 37 years. Now they let him out and he goes from the prison to the palace dining with the king and he's given a position higher than the other kings that are there and he's given an allowance the key verse for me is when it says Jehoiakim put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table he took off his prison clothes because he wasn't a prisoner anymore and he was eating with the king and you know on some level this is what the gospel is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. That when you come to know the king, the real king, the king of kings, and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, and when you open your life to him and let him come in and influence you, and, and you dine at his table and you have intimacy with him, then everything changes. You take off your prison clothes because you're no longer bound by the things that have held you in your past. What are the things that hold you? How about the choices that you've made in the past that haven't worked out so well? How about the choices that other people have made that have affected your life and made you feel like a prisoner emotionally, mentally, when you torture yourself over and over again? Why did I do that? I can't forgive myself. Why did they do that to me? I can't forgive them. Choices that have been made. How about repeated failures over and over again in life when you've tried to get it right and it just doesn't seem to happen? You got married and thought it was for life and you thought it was going to work and it didn't work out the way you thought. Sometimes failures come again and again. Sometimes negatives hit us over and over over the course of life and we feel beaten down. It's interesting in this passage I just read in the King James Version, which is an older version, it translates, verse 27, saying that the king lifted Jehoiakim's head when he took him out of prison. Lifted his head. As if to say, Jehoiakim, you don't have to walk around like this anymore. Ashamed, guilty, burdened, feeling defeated. Lifted his head. Are you a prisoner? Oh, maybe not behind iron bars that you can see or that anybody else can see, but a prisoner just the same because of things that have happened in your life. Are you struggling to find the way out, to find the key that would open that door to release you and set you free? The Bible says that if we live by faith in this life, that in the next life we'll be in heaven with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we'll dine at the heavenly table, and it'll be amazing. But the freedom that it speaks of takes place now. The moment you believe, the moment, the moment you trust, the moment you turn yourself over to him, the moment you declare, I can't do this myself anymore. 
that's when he comes in and takes his seat on the throne of our lives and our hearts. But you know, many people reject all of this because they say, I don't deserve this because of what's happened in the past, because of the guilt and the shame. They're saying, how can this be that somebody would love me so much that like Jesus, he would die for me on a cross that I could be set free from all this ugly stuff in my life. And so we continue to walk around with our head down. And we fool everybody else around us when they say, how you doing? Great, great, life is great, yeah. And then when we're alone, the darkness comes. And the negativity and the nastiness and everything else that we've been dragging around with us. And we go back into the prison prison that's always there, but we feel it more maybe when we're alone. And Jesus says, I want to set you free. It's why I came. I died to set you free. And you can hold your head up because you're not good enough. That's the whole point. You can't do it yourself. You need help. You need a savior. And that's why God has given us one so that life can be different, so that we can go from the prison to the palace so that we can understand that we're loved and that we're forgiven and that there's always do-overs, there's always start-overs with God, no matter what's happened in the past. In him we have new life. And that we can take off those clothes, those prison clothes, even though they may cling to us because we say, ah, I don't deserve to be loved and forgiven. God's message says differently. And it's already done. It's already been taken care of. God has already sent Jesus, and he died and accomplished the purpose that God had for him to set us free. Maybe you know this. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for years. But I find in a lot of people's lives, there's that little something that they never quite relinquish. There's that thing that you did or was done to you, and nobody else knows and you act happy or you say, yes, I'm a Christian, and you sing the songs and you pray the prayers, but there's just that something that you've never quite fully released to God. And so there's still that sense of being chained or imprisoned. I invite you this morning to turn a corner, to turn a page, to take off the prison clothes as we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion, as we share the bread and the cup together. You know what that's about? That's about Christ saying, I will die for you so you can live for me. And not live in a prison, but live free and dine with me at the king's table. Though you may not feel worthy, I came so that that could happen. We're going to get ready to receive communion now, and I want to pray a prayer of preparation for all of us. And I invite you to, to make this sacrament, this experience, something different maybe than it's been before. More than a ritual, more than, yeah, give me a piece of bread, yeah, I'll drink that little cup. But to understand that the purpose of the sacrament is to experience God's presence in your life, to ask for grace to come to you, to experience forgiveness, and, and, and receive it and accept it and believe that it's true. And so in this experience, give a little more of yourself to God. And if you've never given yourself to God, do it in the sacrament and say it as a prayer from your heart to heaven because he's there and he's waiting and he's listening and he wants more than anything for you to pray that prayer. Lord, I've been holding back. I've been holding back. I've trusted my strength, my wisdom, my money to get me through and now I know I can't do it. And Lord, I surrender to you. Gracious God, can it be that you love us this much, that you would send your son to die for us. Can it, be, can it be true that we do have worth and we do have value, that you who made us and know us so well want us and want to save us from ourselves and from the past? Can it be? Yes, it can be and it is. And your word, which is a love letter to us, says it over and over again. And so, Lord, as we approach the sacrament of Holy Communion, Please, grant us forgiveness. Wash away the sin and the shame and the guilt that we carry around because of that, because of what we've done or what's been done to us. Take it away, Lord. We take off our prison clothes this morning. Set us free. Help us to experience something new in this service right now as we get ready.
to receive the bread and the cup. May it truly be for us the body and blood of Christ. And may your grace be at work in our hearts and minds now as we receive together. May your spirit move in a powerful way to set us free. For we ask all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.